because now we're talking about not radiation or wind or reflectance, but a measurement of gases in the air, and particularly oxygen. And this is so powerful because gases are used to measure metabolic rates of bacteria, of plants, of people, and particularly, of course, oxygen and CO2. We measure photosynthesis by measuring CO2 changes, but oxygen also changes, and oxygen sensors are far cheaper than CO2 sensors. So we have for some time sold this oxygen sensor. And this is a picture of what it looks like buried in soil. It's one of the common applications, putting it in soil to measure soil gas concentration. Obviously, if a plant is growing and it's healthy and it's consuming oxygen in the soil, the oxygen goes down in the soil. So number one, we want to understand how low that is. But number two, the rate at which it goes down helps us tell the respiration rate of the root system of the plant, which tells us something about health of the plant. So it's both to monitor oxygen and to do metabolic rate studies. This sensor fundamentally, it's a galvanic cell sensor. So it causes a chemical reaction with the oxygen gas, which creates a tiny voltage, and it's measured by a data logger. So that's the general physics of the signal transduction of this, the changing of the gas. It has a screen on the end. I don't know if we have an oxygen sensor here. Peter, do you know if we have an oxygen sensor here? We could pass one around. That's a, um, and it, it, that helps keep the water away from the sensing tip, but also to, to measure a bigger volume of soil. Um, th these are a, a few hundred dollars. I mean, I can't remember the exact price, but they're not thousands. So that means they're much more accessible to many more people to have multiple sensors. I think I have a couple example pictures of this, and then I want to talk about how they work. Here's one application in the lab. We've used this quite a bit in my lab. Here's a Petri dish sealed. Um, the tip, drill a, drill a tiny hole, put the sensor in there, and we're measuring the change in oxygen in this Petri dish, which is an indication of the metabolic rate of these seeds. At real sensitive to this, here's another one in a jar, drill a hole, put the sensor in the top. Now in this jar, there's no respiration going on, it's clear water. It's not, it's metabolically inert, but if we run the temperature up and down, we would like to get zeros in that jar, and all kinds of things are changing. The humidity in the jar is changing, which dilutes the oxygen but we want to make the appropriate correction factors so we can get a clean zero in a jar where there really isn't any respiration. So this is a laboratory use of this, but it also has a similar uses in the field. Just a review, I love to show this equation. This is the, I tell the students, this is the most important equation in the world to a biologist. This is respiration going this way, and photosynthesis going this way, and if we can measure the rate of oxygen depletion or the rate of CO2 buildup, we know the metabolic rate. And that's just, it's as simple as that. One mole of oxygen disappearing means one mole of carbon has been metabolized in respiration. So we can precisely calculate metabolism. And you can do that with either oxygen or CO2. Of course, the background of oxygen is much higher. There's a, this is a picture of it with the meter and the sensor on the end. So, now to come full circle, in the very first talk I talked about relative and absolute humidity, that's the water vapor in air. That same principle applies to all the gases in air. We have relative measurements, which are listed here, and we have absolute units listed on the other side. 
relative, not surprisingly, it's percent. The same as exact concept as relative humidity. We, we can call that mole fraction, the pressure of oxygen divided by total pressure, parts per million, another measure of the same thing. But in this case, in the case of humidity, the sensors measure relative units and we calculated absolute units. In this case, the sensor is measuring the absolute units and we convert to relative units. Uh, but these, cons these uh, units are exactly the same. The moles are mass of the gas per unit volume. So let me go through a couple of examples of how this affects us. Now, this all comes from what we all learned in even high school chemistry, PV equals NRT. Pressure and volume equals the moles times ideal gas constant times absolute temperature. And if you're making these measurements, you get good at making those conversions so you can calculate metabolic rate. Here's the sensors respond to absolute and we calibrate it in relative. Barometric pressure affects the concentration of gas in the air. It's easy to measure pressure, easy to measure it electronically. I'm not going to talk about our sensor, but it's easy to measure it. If the pressure changes and gets higher pressure, that gas gets more dense, and you conclude that there's respiration, but there's not. It's, it's a change in pressure. Here's a great way to show it. Elevation. Barometric pressure is the red line as we go up the top of Mount Everest, and the unit over here is concentration of gas. Now, here's another test question. So we, we know virtually everybody needs compressed oxygen to climb Mount Everest. What's the percent? The percent oxygen at sea level is 20.95%. What's the percent oxygen on the top of Mount Everest? It's exactly the same. So if it's just 20.95%, why we need oxygen? Well, low pressure. The density of oxygen molecules is way less. And that's an example of the correction for pressure. So when we're measuring this, we often measure pressure with it so we can correct for differences in pressure and sort out metabolism from uh, everything else. Pressure doesn't change that much. High pressure fronts, low pressure fronts, this is a high altitude pressure, but still pressure from highs to lows only changes the density of air about 1% and maybe 2% on extreme events. So our, our pressures, even though they have a huge effect on our weather, only have a small effect on the density of gas. But we measure and correct for that. So now we put this sensor in soil, and we want to measure the changes in oxygen in soil. Soil is very close to 100% humidity all the time, because it's all these wet surfaces all in equilibrium with the gas. What happens if you put a sensor in soil like this, it's, got a, it's a tiny, Gore-Tex membrane that's gas permeable, but it doesn't let water into the sensor. If you put that in soil and you just leave it, sooner or later it gets condensation on the membrane because 100% humidity and the soil temperature is cycling, well, the sensor stops working. It's the membrane is got water on it, gas can't come in. So we heat the sensor just a little bit just one degree C above background, and that prevents condensation. It's not enough to change the metabolism, but it is enough to keep the condensation off the sensor. The other factor, the reason water vapor is a big deal is water vapor is maybe 3% of the molecules in the air, but as the humidity and temperature go up and down, the oxygen gets diluted. These the water vapor molecules come in, and again, it's apparent respiration only because of dilution of the gas. And I won't go through all the details of this, but it, you have to correct for the temperature of the soil. T 
to get the absolute oxygen concentration. And this is happening in the background in software of the, of the uh, sensor to sort out what fraction of the change in signal is true metabolism by plant roots and what fraction is just apparent caused by changes in the gas composition. Obviously, if this, this, this thing in air and it gave us a 21% and then we put it in 100% humidity, it, it starts to read lower because of all the oxygen, all the water vapor molecules um, diluting the oxygen molecules. There it is, same thing, and that's how we do this test and the corrections for it. And finally, the third thing is temperature, PVNRT. This is absolute Kelvin temperature, but as the temperature goes up and down, it also changes the density of the air and the oxygen in the air. That's Then there's a temperature effect on electronics of the sensor we had to correct for, and then gas-liquid partitioning, the amount of gas in solution and the amount in the air, and here's enough, the temperature and the parent change in reading. This is at 19 to 22 uh, degrees. It's a big effect of temperature, um, and this is also the this red line is the effect on the electronics. And fortunately, it's pretty flat in here from about 15 to 35 C. But at hot and cold temperatures, we need to correct for uh, temperature. Temperature affects almost every single sensor we have. There's hardly any sensor that doesn't have some temperature interaction. And we're always measuring those and correcting for them in software or trying to build sensors that are so robust they have a minimal temperature effect. And now, a couple slides and some final slides. I'm going to close with people have suggested sensors we might build. And as a company, we're constantly thinking of what's our next sensor we're going to work on. And what, how do we decide what kind of sensors to work on? I'll, I'll tell you, it's, no, it's not brain surgery. How many are we going to sell? How many people would buy a sensor like this if we build it? If it's 10, we probably won't build the sensor. If it's 100, then we decide how much R&D will it take to make the first one. And it's a ratio of investment cost for R&D to the number sold. And when that gets favorable, we decide to work on the sensor. But it's also how much R&D will it take. That I don't know, Mark, how long we've been working on that net radiometer. I mean, we, we got it. Probably three years. Yeah. Um, we got a lot of money invested in making the first one. And so we're just now getting them on the, on the market. Um, so you hold your breath as a company and hope people will buy the stuff that you build. Otherwise, you're going to be out of business. Here's, here's a sensor that we're looking at. We've done some preliminary testing and I could make a joke and say don't tell our competitors about this but even if you told them they'd say well that's a hard sensor to build we're not going to make it because it's too much of a risk. They, it, there's a lot of R&D. If we can make a sensor in soil that both measures carbon dioxide and oxygen together we can get what's called respiratory quotient and that tells us what materials are being metabolized by the bacteria in the soils. And, and I'll give you some examples of respiratory motion, but here's an example of a bucket and some oxygen sensors and a CO2 sensor. So remember that equation? Um, I might have that. Yeah. There's our equation. This is, when this goes that way, this is one, that's one. That means the respiratory quotient is one. But what if the bacteria were metabolizing lignin? Now, lignin is CH2 with hardly any oxygen, or fats. Fats hardly have any oxygen. Substrates change in the ratio of CH2O, and that changes the ratio of CO2 and oxygen. 
and with such a sensor we can tell what's being metabolized in the soil. Here's a couple, there's the backgrounds. Um, this is the advantage of measuring CO2. There's so little in the background it's easy to measure a change. I mean this is just 0.04 percent CO2 in the air. We can easily measure change. This is a huge background. So it's hard to measure tiny changes in oxygen. It's easy to measure tiny changes in CO2. Um, anytime we do these me metabolic measurements, we have bicarbonate effects, and that's a whole other lecture which I'm not going to talk about. But CO2 goes in and out of solution, and it's not a metabolism, and we've got to correct for that. And then oxygen is also the sensors, much lower cost. Although we're working with some CO2 sensors now that are, we think they're going to be down around $300 um, that to do this. So the cost of CO2 sensors is coming down. So this would normally be one to one. But look at this. This is this respiratory quotient. Carbohydrates, one. Proteins, 0.8. Fats 0.6 and lignin 0.2. So we could begin to start to see what's being degraded, what type of material is being degraded if we can develop this sensor. So we, we think this would sell a lot and it's, it's one we're slowly working toward to develop there. So there's people that, was it Wendy, Wendy Silver, every year, how's that sensor coming along? She's, she's really anxious to buy them as soon as you announce it. Here's another huge deal. We know that we put ammonium on and even in an ecosystem the degradation makes ammonium and the bacteria gradually oxidize this to nitrate. This respiratory quotient uses two oxygen and doesn't make any oxygen it's zero. So we can begin to tell what forms of nitrogen the bacteria are, are utilizing in a soil. So sometimes we don't like to say what we're working on because people get so excited they want it to happen next year and it's way down the road. And we have a big problem as our company and others of when do you t say when a sensor is going to be ready because people get anxious to buy it and it, sometimes it, you think it's going to be ready next month and it still takes six more months. It, um, you, you, keep, you keep working on refining the technologies. But this is, this is one that's in the early idea stages. So, that's one of my favorite slides, but I'm going to conclude with that. Um, I hope this gets you excited about making more measurements with more kinds of sensors. It's, it's, a, it's a joy to collect data and, and you, get, you know how the world is supposed to work and then you try and measure it and see if it really works like that. And linking back to those very first quotes I showed, if theory and measurement don't agree, you got a red light. And, but, and the amazing thing is the theory is wrong sometimes and your measurements are rock solid. And, and you can get a Nobel Prize for turn, overturning some things we thought we knew that we really don't know so well. And after all, that's what research is. Researching, take stuff we thought we knew and see if we really know it. And a lot of, that's a huge danger of if we think we know something and we're pretty sure we know it and we're wrong, that's one of the worst problems of all of science. Um, and with measurements getting better and better and better, we can revisit some things that we thought we knew. Um, so I hope you get an opportunity to uh, use these instruments and, and uh, in your research and your, all your endeavors. And we look forward to the potential of working for you.